Hello, ladies. I know I look ridiculous. I'm supposed to be a soybean, and that's what we're talking about today, soybeans. I'm just so glad to be back with you. You know, giving these tutorials is my very favorite thing to do. And I started out this whole menopause series with a detailed syllabus. I thought I had included everything about menopause. But many of your comments, questions, or requests have made me realize that there are things that I had left out. So every time I encounter a situation like that, I add it to the syllabus. And today's topic is a result of one of those questions posed by one of you. The question was about genetically modified soy, or GMO soy. And I believe that for every person who asks a question, there are 10 others who are wondering the very same thing but don't actually ask the question. And while I knew a little bit about GMO soy at the time, I realized that I just didn't know enough. So, I ordered all these books on genetic modification of food. I read them all, highlighted and cross-referenced them, and prepared this video for you. That's what I do, the research. So just so you know, I'm not one of those people who pretends to know everything. I'll tell you right now, I don't know everything. But when I don't know something, I'll tell you I don't know. And I'll get busy researching high and low to find the answers so that you don't have to do all that yourself. And today's video is a product of my research. My viewer asks the question, how do you avoid genetically modified soy? So let me tell you what I've learned. Whether you eat soy or not, you should watch this video because there are many foods that are genetically modified. And whether you're trying to avoid them or consume them, it's good to know what I'm going to tell you. Let's start defining what genetically modified means. But first, let's describe what non-genetically modified means. Before there was genetic modification, farmers identified the plants, in this case soybeans, that had the most desirable traits. So they picked the very best soybeans. And the best ones were the ones that were the sweetest and resisted insects the best. And in order to grow more of the most desirable plants, they would breed more of the highest quality soybeans by planting them along with the run-of-the-mill mediocre ones. Mother Nature has a way of favoring the best traits. So if there are superior genes among the mediocre ones, the tendency is for the superior genes to be dominant and to drown out the inferior ones. And that's exactly what would eventually happen naturally with no help from mankind. But that takes time. And humans are not very patient. It would take a few generations or seasons for the soybeans with the superior traits to dominate. But with genetic modification, humans bypass all the time it takes for this to happen naturally according to Mother Nature's timetable. So genetic modification involves transferring a specific dominant gene carrying the desirable trait directly into the soybean plant. But genetic modification can actually do even more than that. It can supersede anything Mother Nature could possibly manage. It can involve adding genes into the plant that aren't even within the realm of plant genes. In other words, it can involve inserting properties from animals into plants. So what it all boils down to is this. Genetic modification is the introduction of foreign genetic material from one kind of organism into another living organism. And in the case of soybeans, it involves injecting organisms into the soybean plants to make them super soybeans. Now you're probably wondering why anyone would genetically modify a crop instead of just letting nature take its course. So I'll tell you the reasons cited by the companies that perform the genetic modifications, and there are a few. 
The first reason cited is that genetically modified soy increases the yield of the crop. In other words, they say that the genetically modified soy grows faster and produces more soybeans than the non-genetically modified crops. But everything I read argued against that justification. The studies reveal that all the higher yields are due to improvements in conventional agricultural techniques, not genetic modification. The second reason given for genetic modification is that it reduces use of pesticides. But all the data show the opposite. Genetic modification actually increases pesticide use. The third reason for genetic modification is that without it, there isn't enough food to feed the world. And again, everything I read showed that planet Earth already produces enough food to feed the projected world population of 9 billion by the year 2050. The problem is that we feed much of it to animals, and then we eat the animals instead of just eating the food ourselves. <laughs> so when it comes down to the justifications for genetically modifying soy, there is a big controversy between the company that does the genetic modifying on one side and the scientists, farmers, and public on the other. So now let's address how common genetic modification of soy is and how much genetically modified soy dominates our soy supply. The majority of the soy in all of North America and all of South America, that means U.S., Canada, and all the countries in South America, is genetically modified. In India and Asia, there are some other crops like corn and cotton that are genetically modified, but not soy. And in Europe, genetic modification of crops is entirely banned. But the fear is that once there are any genetically modified crops, it's impossible to prevent contamination of all crops with the genetic modification. So what if all crops are genetically modified? What's the risk in that? Is there any harm? Do you remember way back in tutorials 18, 19, and 20 when I taught you about the differences in regulation and safety between botanicals and herbs versus pharmaceutical drugs, you learned that there really isn't any regulation for botanicals and herbs. And because there's no regulation, you have to be aware that botanical and herbal products are inconsistent and contaminated. There's no guarantee that they're safe. You learn that there are no research studies on the effects of botanical and herbal products. So that's why you don't get a great big sheet full of disclaimers and possible risks when you buy herbal products like you do when you buy pharmaceutical products. So you get this kind of thing with every pharmaceutical drug. But when you buy an herbal product, you get nothing. There are no disclaimers, there's no research, there's no literature. Now foods have even less regulation than herbal products. So when you buy fresh food, anything that constitutes a food has almost no guarantees at all. You eat food that's contaminated, processed, and even pumped full of artificial coloring, preservatives, and chemicals that you can't even pronounce. Do you think genetically modified soy is worse than those things? Processed food doesn't make you sick or kill you on the spot. And most overripe fresh fruit doesn't either. And neither does genetically modified soy. But the concern is whether there are long-term consequences. Do you worry about the long-term consequences of eating junk food or fast food? I guarantee you that there are long-term consequences of eating junk food and fast food. Does that stop you from eating it? Heck, I'll bet you even notice short-term consequences of eating junk food. You probably feel full, bloated after eating all sorts of foods. Does that stop you from eating them? As with many things in our world, we are stuck with the fact 
that many of our crops have been genetically modified. And because of the deep political debate that underlies the genetically modified area, it's unlikely that there's going to be a consensus that genetically modified foods are harmful. As with all matters of controversy, it's up to you to decide how you feel about eating genetically modified soy or any other genetically modified foods. But the same goes for junk food and fast food. There's no question that it's bad for you. Do you eat it anyway? If it doesn't matter to you, then don't worry about it. But don't be hypocritical. If you're putting junk into your body willingly, don't point the finger at companies who are genetically modifying food. These two things really constitute in two different ways of eating badly. But if it does matter to you, the next question becomes, how do I avoid genetically modified food? Here's what I can tell you. You can be sure that a food is not genetically modified if it is labeled 100% organic. The 100% is critical. If it just says organic, it may still be genetically modified. So organic does not mean non-GMO. But by law, 100% organic is non-GMO. The most common genetically modified foods are corn and corn derivatives, especially high fructose corn syrup soybeans and soy products, canola oil, sugar beets, dairy products, sugar, any food that is pre-prepared, Hawaiian papaya, zucchini, and yellow crookneck squash. If you eat meat or dairy products at all, you are doing at least as much harm to your body as you're doing by eating any kind of genetically modified food. And if you do eat meat and you're looking for non-genetically modified beef, you buy 100% grass-fed beef. And if you want to avoid genetically modified fruits and vegetables, you need to know some very specific things about what to look for. With fruits and vegetables, it's all about the coating. And the coating is a science onto itself. It's complicated. I don't have any idea as to the logic, but here's what you need to know. What you do is look at the codes on all fruits and vegetables. They all have a four or five digit number. Let's start with the five digit numbers. So five digits beginning with an eight. I don't know if you can see this. Five digits beginning with an eight mean that they are GMO. That means these are genetically modified. Any five digit number beginning with eight is genetically modified. Any five digit beginning with the number nine is organic. Now that may or may not be genetically modified. Organic does not mean non-genetically modified. So nine means organic. But remember, organic doesn't mean non-GMO. So none of the five digit codes guarantee anything about the GMO status. So finally we get to the four digit codes. And four digit codes are where you can be sure that it's non-GMO. So anytime you have a four digit code, it is non-GMO. Just think of four digits, non-GMO. Just look for the number of digits, it's that simple. And then you can just avoid all the fruits and vegetables with any five digit code and only buy the ones with four digit codes. Now here are some other things you can do to avoid genetically modified foods if that's what you want to do. You can avoid all processed and all foods that are pre-prepared. You can quit eating out at all restaurants and you can grow your own food. Or you can look for this little stamp that says non-GMO. It's tiny here, right next to my fingernail. It's usually colorful 
and it's a little tiny stamp that says non-GMO. And you'll see that on various foods. But it's not on everything. That's one of the pitfalls. It's not on everything that is non-GMO. So one thing you've learned here is that while most people tend to point the finger at soy when they talk about foods adulterated with genetically modified organisms, there are many things other than soy that are in the same boat. So if you have an interest in avoiding GMO soy specifically, here are some facts about soy. There are certain specific brands of soy that are non-GMO. Eden is one of them. Wildwood is another. Tofurky is another. And a fourth one is Mitoku, which I don't have. Those four brands, Eden, Wildwood, Tofu, and Tofurky, and Mitoku are all non-GMO. So all these products made by these companies, whether it's soy, milk, tofu, or anything else, you can be sure that it's non-GMO. Although some of those that are non-GMO don't, don't have that little GMO, non-GMO stamp. So some of those companies still don't put that little stamp on them. So you can look for the stamp or you can go look for the company name. Inconsistencies with how things are labeled and where the stamp is make this even more confusing than it is already. But ladies, one of the things you're going to learn by watching my videos is that there are some things you cannot change and some things you can change. It is up to you to decide what you want to change. There are many harmful things in the environment to which you are exposed, whether you choose to be or not. And we all have different levels of cautionary behavior. So as always, I urge you not to blind yourself to the forest by seeing only the trees. And if you eat the typical American diet of fast food, junk food, restaurant food, preserved food, meat, and dairy, you are polluting your body with things that are much worse than GMO anything. This whole education is about knowing the facts and ordering your priorities. Avoiding genetically modified foods should not take priority over omitting all these other detrimental things. But if you're already a vegan who never eats anything but fresh foods, and by all means, focus on eliminating genetically modified foods, just don't think that they're the worst things out there. <laughs> so I hope this tutorial has helped you with some of your questions about your GMO dilemma. And I'll wrap it up here, and I'll see you again in a week. Be sure to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram in the meantime, and subscribe to my channel so that you get the videos coming to you every week. I'll see you then. Bye.